I'm so excited about this panel. Are you excited? Yay! Yay. Uh, who here has uh, used ChatGPT? Wow, that's like 90%. How about um, Mid Journey uh, or Stable Diffusion Image um, Generation AI? Oh, that's like 50%. And how many here have already incorporated uh, generative AI into their business or the way they, uh, you work? Oh, that's like good, 30%, wow. And who here believes that AI is gonna take all the, over the world? <laughs> a little bit, yeah, a little bit 10%. Okay, that's great, that's great. Um, so th on this panel, uh, we will talk about generative AI, a very exciting topic. Uh, and because this is a G1, uh, we would like to uh, touch not just on the technological aspect of it, but also the business uh, implication, as well as a uh, political uh, implication as well. So Kitano-san, uh, I would like you to uh, open uh, this panel. Uh, I'm sure uh, you have seen, um, as an AI expert and researcher for a long time, a lot of AI uh, boom, uh, as well as AI winter. I want to uh, ask, uh, uh, what's different uh, this time? Uh, and uh, you know, um, how much excited uh, we should be, or is it overhyped? Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, inviting me for this panel, and then uh, uh, you know, since I got the uh, older remote uh, telepresence, uh, I seems to be having a much more aerial space is another speaker you know at the big screen now but anyway uh, well but I, I think the question this is like you know ai boom and ai winter is a uh, very interesting and we have that like, you know few ai uh summer or like AI winter and then the first one is like uh you know very beginning of the uh you know ai and then uh you know with the uh, minsky's perceptron you know book uh, uh, you know, the expectations are quickly faded. And then uh, we came like, uh, uh, you know, inference machine days or like, uh, you know, expert system. Uh, and then, uh, you know, expectation is like everything, like knowledge can be extracted and written in form of the bunch of rules. And then uh, if we execute a rule or a logical programming, we should be able to uh, do a, a lot of like intelligent tasks, you know. I think expert system is a partially uh, useful uh, even now that, uh, you know, things that can be uh, executed by the rules I described, uh, very explicit knowledge, and it can still it can be still useful. And uh, but at the same time, there are very clear limitations on the, you know, how we're going to extract the uh, uh, expert knowledge, and also uh, uh, you know how to represent and in uh, you know world, which is uh, not everything is symbolic. We use natural language to describe scene, but at the same time, there are collateral information which are actually interpret. Or you know that uh, uh, you know natural language. So uh, it's a semantic and a cognitive issues which uh, uh, limit uh, the capability of the expert system. Then uh, uh, after the long uh, AI winter, uh, now we come to the uh, uh, stage that the uh, neural net based uh, approach, like uh, starting from the deep learning and then deep reinforcement learning. Now this uh, uh, and then also the GAN and then the generative AI. We come to the stage that actually transformative change in the industry and the society. You know, uh, right now what's going on uh, is uh, this is real. Of course, in part, it's overhyped. But people are dreaming about a future technology. At the same time, with the core part and fundamental part of this technology uh, is real. And they're going to uh, progress uh, even uh, uh, I think we're going to accelerate even more when we got to this stage. So what we are seeing this is that uh, this is equivalent to the invention of the uh, internal combustion engine or semiconductor or the internet. That what we are seeing uh, right now. So in the middle of this uh, a significant transformation of the uh, technology and the industry uh, in a historical scale. But, but that, that, that's actually the baseline. Okay. But what, what is overhyped uh, is like, uh, you know, we are supplies with the capability of the transformer based technology, like a chat GPT or, uh, you know, uh, Google's coming back with the uh, bird. And that is, uh, uh, you know, primarily based on the Lambda system, which they have internally. And uh, uh, stability, I just announced like an open source, like a large scale language model. And Anthropic uh, come up to like a their model as well. So like, uh, you know, we have like, uh, you know, heard of, uh, uh, you know, uh, large scale language model. 
and which is based on the uh, theory called the transformer. And then we have like uh, uh, stability and uh, uh, you know stable diffusions and mid journey and uh, runway uh, Gen one Gen two, which is primarily uh, based on the uh, diffusion model. And uh, you know that's the interesting part is like uh, there are uh, you know fundamental theory which is there are very sophisticated mathematics behind it, and uh, to be able to uh, you know uh, underlie the uh, ensure the uh, uh, underlying theoretical uh, aspect as well. So uh, uh, but, but in a way, people are so excited about this. At the same time, like uh, uh, but there are some limitations because it's basically uh, at the core it is a statistical uh, predictor. Uh, of the what comes next and then uh, how we're going to restore the uh, images and then how you're going to generate it. Uh, but at the same time, like, I, I think like, everyone involved is very, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know recognize that limitation. And then uh, I'm sure like everyone is working day and night to overcome those limitations and add the uh, series of new features that the uh, all the shortcoming to be uh, covered. But you know, the, you know, one of the things that people thought, like, you know, sometimes you see like a things being created, which is actually probably a partly mimicking like a human cognition. At the same time, because of the uh, uh, access to the uh, very large volume of data, uh, basically they're cloning everything possible. And then, uh, but, so when you actually ask some questions, for example, in ChatGPT or like a bird, you know, they actually come up with answer which you haven't seen before, or like a seen creative. But probably in a way, that's like a, someone wrote that in a, somewhere in a web page which we haven't accessed. And then also like a, you know, all kind of things that we have learned. So, uh, but this uh, system basically, uh, you know, accessing the information the human cannot access in a daily life or any reasonable effort, and they are crawling that and they're learning it. And present it to you. So, in a way, this is like a revolution. I mean, this is actually the one way of, uh, uh, you know, overcoming, uh, you know, information horizon problem, which I usually describe because, you know, the access amount of information we can access, whatever we do, is limited. Uh, in, and, and then, uh, you know, this uh, uh, systems is actually because they have like a very broad, uh, you know, mechanism to actually collect the data and then access the other data and learn it. Uh, you know, they, they can very uh, simply overcome that, you know. So, like, uh, that part is very interesting, but th th that's what they're doing. And uh, so, like, uh, if you expect a little bit more than that, uh, you know, sometimes successful, but, like, uh, there's no intrinsic mechanism to support that. But, uh, of course, like, again, uh, you know, uh, developers and then all, you know, AI researchers, uh, uh, you know, recognize that limitations. And then I think there will be a more, uh, you know, new, new facilities coming in on top of what we are doing. And uh, uh, those will be overcome. So, like, uh, uh, in, in a way, uh, there are limitations. A uh, lot of interesting stuff going on, also limitations. But I think uh, those are uh, shortcomings will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, fixed. Or like, uh, probably we're gonna have like a uh, dramatically improved uh, uh, next generation version sooner or later. Okay, thank, thank you, Kitano-san, for the great opening. Um, I want to get uh, Shane's uh, perspective uh, on this as well. Uh, obviously, uh, OpenAI uh, seems to be um, in the center. Of this uh, generative AI, uh, um, you know, movement uh, uh, activity, um, could you briefly uh, explain in plain language what generative AI is, and also um, what's the latest? Uh, it seems to be there's a news coming out every day, every week. Uh, what's the latest uh, of the generative AI, especially um, at the open AI? Sure. Um, I think in terms of introduction for the generative AI, I think kitano san gave a pretty comprehensive introduction from the text models uh, to this kind of Im uh, image models. Uh, if I kind of have a few things to add, it's really kind of important to understand um, what sort of technology kind of offers, so more kind of precisely, so you don't kind of overestimate it or like underestimate it. So for example, People have been kind of talking uh, when ChatGPT came, it's pretty bad with, uh, bad with mathematics. Or, for example, it doesn't uh, know how to use kind of search or stuff. But those are actually kind of things that, um, you know, it should be kind of dedicated more to the hopefully kind of external tools. Of course, as you kind of improve the large language models, it's going to get better at computation, better at memorizing facts. But those are actually not the things that this gradient based neural network training is kind of particularly good at. But what was kind of discovered, say, last year was the large language model can do step-by-step -step reasoning. And once you can figure out that part, then you can quickly understand that the best way to solve this kind of problem with large language model is to combine classic software, like 
calculators, kind of computers, one from Alpha, Google Search, uh, Microsoft Bin, with the large language model to, to solve those kind of issues. So I think it's quite important to talk more with the researchers to understand what's kind of expected that it's going to be good at and what expected it's going to be kind of bad at. And I don't understand kind of precisely. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, so Zixan, do you have any comments? Oh, so um, oh, maybe like another thing I can sort of end with sure. is um, until last, so la since last year I've been kind of calling, uh, I've been calling the 2022 to be the AGI, mm -hmm. uh, Artificial General Inter uh, Intelligence Year Zero. <laughs> and then um, the reason I kind of do that is I feel like a lot of stuff has been risked for the general intelligence. And another kind of point of saying is until last year, I would say the deep learning wasn't that useful for companies other than Google, Facebook, or basically those ones with huge compute, huge talents, or huge data. What changed last year was that because it can do step by step, because it can do this kind of few shot learning, because we can do a few things that people figure out it's being de risked, basically anyone can use this kind of technology and kind of uh, extract tremendous kind of value out of it. We kind of saw that with the chat GBT, and we're going to see more of that uh, in the coming years, pretty sure. And I think every month from now is going to be more exciting than preceding months. By the way, uh, you mentioned that the 2022 was the AGI, year yes. of AGI. Uh, and I think the mission of OpenAI is to you know, develop AGI that will benefit the <laughs> society. Yeah. Um, uh, how far are we uh, before you know, getting the AGI? I know yeah, you, you I, get I, this question a lot. Yeah, I don't think I can talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, what I can talk is what I was saying before I joined OpenAI. Uh, so I only joined OpenAI uh, four months ago. And then uh, even before that, I was kind of saying from probably last year, April, May, that it's like AGI year zero, everything has been de-risked. The only thing that hasn't been risk maybe is like a dexterity for the kind of hand, but even that could be kind of quite approachable. But any kind of um, um, sort of capability that we can sort of kind of imagine, uh, generative AI is going to have an impact on that. And that's, we are pretty sure, since mid last year. Yeah. Okay. So, so, you know, starting um, uh, last year, you know, this uh, generative AI really uh, kick started. Uh, and um, as uh, two uh, mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of uh, you know, uh, refinement going on, as well as how this uh, new uh, interesting technology can be applied uh, in, in different aspects. Um, but I want to uh, ask Suzuki-san, um, uh, there are right now uh, multiple uh, foundation models, not just the uh, open AI. And uh, what, will be like the, what would you imagine will be the end state uh, for the competitive landscape uh, between uh, foundation models? Yeah, so first of all, so I'm so excited to participate, participate in this so strong innovation. Uh, uh, so, so because so I studied the, uh, the neural network in a grad school, and my master thesis is about the recurrent network. And then so I couldn't imagine that this kind of situation happened. Yeah. But uh, so, and then, so I'm so impressed with what OpenAI has achieved. It's so amazing. But uh, so I think maybe there are several um, uh, so uh, maybe, maybe short points, and uh, the match model is one of the challenging. So and then op GTP4. So actually, so started the uh, uh, the match model by combining the, the image recognition. But uh, so I think there are several uh, additional uh, challenging in terms of the match model. And plus, I think the hallucination is also the very big problem. And uh, at a new tech company, this is a very, very important topic. So uh, this could be used, and this can be used for the, the making the fake news disinformation. Yeah. And then, so uh, we can expect that in the election 2024, and um, more than 90% of the, the content on the social media will be machine generated. So that way, so terrible. And the how to protect that? This is also the big issue. And the another uh, perspective is so the common sense. And I just attended a TED conference, and uh, one of the speakers of the AI session is Ye Jin Choi, a professor of the computer science at the University of Washington. So she says, and so and so open even GTP4 cannot so solve the very easy problem and question 
and uh, like the kids, even kids can answer. So common sense is also there. Yeah, another so topic. And so, but this is amazing uh, innovation. And then, so, but uh, in the end, so I think maybe uh, there are several other competitors. <coughs> so I think maybe you cannot so talk about competitors. So instead, so I will talk. <laughs> so Anthropic uh, is that so uh, established in uh, maybe three years ago. It was a split off of uh, the former VP of research of the OpenAI. And then so he started the company because so there, there was a, a kind of the, the misalignment of the policy, the how to make the, op the AI. I don't know the detail, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. And then so Anthropic so uh, launched the cloud. Uh, it is also great, the LLM, LLM model. And uh, so plus the as you may know, the Google uh, so started the, the bud, and then so it was uh, the quality of the bud itself is not good, but uh, so yesterday they announced that so the deep mind and Google brain will be merged into the one organization, and then yeah. And so, so I was in Google brain for seven and a half years before I joined OpenAI, and yesterday Google brain disappeared. Yeah. Because because when they merged, the new name is Google DeepMind. Like, where's the brain? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and then, but um, so what? So OpenAI has achieved is amazing, impressive. I think the other competitors are behind 1.5 years to two years. It takes maybe 1.5 years or two years to catch up this level GPT-4. I think this is my personal opinion. But in the end, in maybe after five years, six years. The, the competition will be the very aggressive. And I don't, I, don't, I don't know the detail, but for, and uh, in order to so uh, pre-train the large language model, it takes more than 100 million uh, US dollars per one shot, one, one training. And uh, so, and then, so uh, some Altman, uh, so one week ago, some Altman uh, talked about the, so they are, they are not so building uh, GPT-5, but instead, my, I think maybe they are developing 4.1 instead of five. <laughs> it's a kind, to me, yes. it's a kind yes. of the strategy of the uh, OS 10 by Apple, so that they can develop so 4.1, 4.2. But uh, I think maybe this uh, this is a the very very uh, competitive market, and. Uh, and so Sony, so wants to so, uh, the, so enter this market, and uh, so this is the kind of situation. But open AI is so advanced. So, so you, you alluded that so Sony, uh, Sony announced I think last year that um, they will be making their own uh, large language models. Uh, Kitano-san, how do you see the the competitive landscape and, and landscape, and also what what do you think will be the differentiator factor uh, for the to compete against other? Well, this model. is a really interesting market, <laughs> you know, so uh, this is now the battle of titans, uh, you know, large, uh, you know, companies pouring the resource and then uh, create the, uh, you know, own the uh, foundation model for uh, take, like, a large, like, large language model and then all the uh, uh, images, that, you know, so I find it's uh, very interesting also, like, uh, even improving to the water capabilities, uh, you know, you know, uh, including myself, like, uh, you know, like, uh, trying to try out, like, uh, every possible thing to find out what, what's going on behind this. And, uh, but, but interesting, you know, but I think someone actually uh, uh, put on the web page that they try to understand what the uh, uh, capability of, like, uh, either the step-by-step -step reasoning or like a kind of a, a, a capability to understand the nested sentence uh, uh, interpretations. So they found, someone found out like a, it's possible to have a, a two-layer nested sentence, but probably not three-layer nested sentences because it's so complicated. You have to have the word recursive understanding, uh, recursive uh, inference to be able to do that, you know. Uh, so like, uh, you know, I haven't checked that myself, so like, uh, you know, uh, can't really say for sure, but like, uh, there are all kind of, uh, uh, capability proving uh, going on this morning. Now, in terms of position, uh, we are not really in the search engine business or chatbot in the business at this moment. So, like our strategy is actually create a foundation model for the creators. So we are uh, in, in the uh, you know entertainment segment and then uh, uh, other segments, some industry segment as well. But like uh, you know, so. Uh, 
uh, will, uh, we're going to build uh, uh, the foundation model for that purpose. Uh, you know, so, and then also, of course, like uh, language is like a, a very critical part of the intelligence. So like, I think we're interested in the language as well. Uh, but at the same time, not everything need to be, uh, uh, you know, completely built by the uh, Sony. We can actually have uh, a partnership uh, with the various players, you know, so like uh, uh, in, in a way we are tech company at the same time, how we're going to use technology is for creators, you know, so like, uh, you know, when it, whenever we need to build the foundation model uh, by ourselves, uh, either it's a transformer model or like, a, you know, diffusion model or other, uh, based on other theories, uh, you know, if we need, we need to uh, do it by ourselves or we do it, uh, we could think like, uh, okay, let's go for the, uh, some sort of alliance and then we're going to vote for it. And if you think like, uh, wow, I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, open AI, uh, you know, just service or like a stability runway or anthropic. Yeah, if we think like uh, we can just use it and then partner with them, and then we're gonna go for it, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, whatever uh, uh, you know, our position is whatever technology yeah, advance, uh, uh, we're gonna take advantage of them, and then uh, you know, we're gonna uh, assemble that or build ourselves, and then that's all for creators. That's our position, you know. Uh, the, our direction is very clear. We are a company for creators. Okay, uh, Michel. Um so how do you how do you view this you know generative AI and also from the perspective of Mozilla Foundation that you're leading, uh, how do you approach and address uh, this new development uh, of AI? Well, my, I'll start with an analogy. So, for consumers, the internet appeared with the browser, but the internet and its predecessors had been around for 15, 20 years. You know, if you were an academic or a grad student in science, you were using the internet, but it, it took the browser to make it actually accessible. And so, you know, AI has been around for quite a long time through its winters and so on. And this moment of generative AI as making it accessible, you know, ac across a broad range. And so I, I see it as analogous in that sense. It's not new. Um, it's already in use in many places that people don't know. Um, but as a, um, I, I'll call it an inflection point of accessibility um, where it's so obvious now. So that's one. Um, also, an inflection point, I think, across a whole range of human activities. There's business, of course, and there's knowledge, but I also think our own cosmology and our own understanding, you know, it is uncanny how step-by-step -step reasoning or, you know, feels human. So, you know, so I, I think a bunch of questions of what is human and what is human creation and if this is just mimicry, how much of us is mimicry? So. I, I think these questions about, uh, you know, what is art, what is creativity, are are now up up in the air, and we've seen those before. You know, uh, you know, Photoshop. You know, to some a painter from 500 years ago would have, you know, generated the same kinds of questions. But we're right on the cusp of all of those right now. So many find it frightening. I, I find it wildly exciting, um, and I will say. I find very often the difference between real fear and excitement turns out to be are you a science fiction reader or not? Uh, and the ability to you know, actually kind of have worked your way mentally through different forms of human society where it's actually not the same and the relationship with mechanical things the last hundred years but now digital creative things. So I, I think that just as you know, we can't understand the view of a a peasant or a serf, you know, 500 years ago, we're, we're on the cusp of that change. Um, and I think it will come faster because we have the internet now. You know, so we have instantaneous communication, we have increasing amounts of compute, these large enough data sets, uh, which will also grow, well, you'll give me the number, like, you know, probably not, not linearly, but in some other fashion, you know, over the next few years. So giant change is coming. Um, and because it's accessible now, you do see this race for everyone to think, well, how would I use it? How do I incorporate it? What can I do with it? And so that's a place where at the Mozilla Foundation, uh, uh, you know, we've been looking pretty carefully. Like, we're not going to be a, a competitor, at a, you know, at the, at the foundational level. Um, but we do have a, a brand and a history of trust and being trustworthy in, in a technological platform space. And so one of the things we're looking at really carefully is 
what is it like to actually use these capabilities in a whole range of products and how do we help people do that well? Like we saw with the mobile phone, like one of the things that the old browser is good at is real security in the sense of you know, taking input from untrusted sources and providing protection. Well, the apps on your phone aren't that good at it. <laughs> I mean, we can see that like there's a level of understanding that's actually lost in today's computing because we use apps, which are not you know, designed with that in mind. And so in this era, as, as AI, but in particular generative AI, gets built into more and more things, before it's quite ready, right? Like, what are the tools we can build and create um, to help those using AI do so in a more trustworthy way? Okay, thanks. Uh, we will we will touch on the regulation and you know the trustworthy ways uh, a little bit later. But um, do you want to? Yeah, do you have uh, I have a com uh, question to Mitchell, and uh, you are the one of the the first employees of the Netscape, and uh, so and then after that the the, the the Mozilla was established uh, after Netscape. And then, so it's an open source model. And uh, do you think the, and, and then, so uh, recently, uh, Stable AI started the open source model. Do you think the open source will be the strong uh, the competitor to the proprietary model in, in terms of the foundation of the large language model? Um, over time, yes. Mm. Right, I, um, so, so, so there's a lot of things in there, and there's geopolitics and there's security in those questions as to is open or open source safe? Is it right now? But, but over time, yes. I mean, we have this odd setting now that there's a small handful of organizations that can actually build and create this. Um, of course, we know some. There's a set in China, I'm sure, right, you know, that, that we're not aware of. Um, and you know, if I might, you know, some level of surprise even among the creators at the speed of what's happened and, and how useful it is. And uh, at some levels a fear that other people would have access to it, right? You know, we, we see as we use the models now that it escapes the guidelines and you can find your way around the policies and you, you can get these, um, the current offerings to do things that the creators are, or the people offering them are trying not to do that. But somewhere, those models are unbound. <laughs> you can ask those models to do anything. Um, and uh, you know, some of those things are violent. Like human beings do these terrible things to each other. So, so, so there's a fear of, well, what if everybody had that power, right? And, and so we have a question now about, yeah, are the small group of people who created it the right place to have all that power? Um, but clearly, when everyone has that power, really bad things are going to happen. Um, uh, that's the difficulty with humanity. And, uh, but, but if you ask me, do I think it's going to happen? Yes, over time. I do not think this stuff is going to be the giant secret that you know, 10 great companies in the world have to themselves. Mm -hmm. So, so far we've been talking about the foundation uh, model, model layer. And um, uh, there's also another layer on top of it, uh, which is sometimes called like application layer. Uh, so those are the uh, individual applications specific to certain tasks or specific to certain industry that will leverage uh, the foundation model using plugin or something. Uh, and this is, uh, some people say it's going to be, there's going to be a Cambrian uh, explosion uh, on this application layer. Uh, but one difficulty is um, not being too reliant on, on certain foundation um, model. Uh, you know, uh, for example, in smartphone app, uh, uh, as an app, uh, it's, there's a risk in being too dependent on, for example, Google, Android, or uh, Apple, iOS, and, and those platforms. Um, Kensa, what do you think uh, is the, uh, the right balance uh, as an application layer company uh, to, to work with the foundation model, to leverage their power, but not being too reliant uh, on it? Yeah, the, I think the competition is a very important factor uh, to the make the balance of the this uh, the uh, for the application layers players, and uh, yeah, actually, so we need to so rely on the open AI now, but uh, the maybe two years or three years later, maybe the uh, we will have a the comparable level, the GPT, and then maybe we can choose so which so the foundation is so applicable for each uh, each applications, and uh, but. Uh, 
actuality is so, and uh, this this will be the finally the a kind of the commodity, something like uh, the the AWS or something like that, and uh, and then so we can build the our own application based on, um, for example, open source model or open AI or other uh, foundation, but I think still. It's so going on, and uh, so now, so we need to so rely on the open AI, and so that's the kind of situation. Do you have any comments? Shane? Sure, uh, a lot of comments on the application layer. So um, one thing I definitely want to emphasize is uh, basically this discussion of like open source versus this kind of API access. Uh, one is definitely this kind of safety aspect of uh, what can be sort of done with it, and uh, one kind of reason that open kind of register API access. Uh, exactly for the safety, such that we can do like a lot of prototyping and we can gradually sort of deploy incremental sort of kind of features through the kind of API, and also kind of really check if there's kind of companies or people kind of really abusing it for very malicious purpose. So we kind of build in this kind of tools with it. Uh, another thing is, is also kind of go back to this like, is open source like pretty much the way to democratize the technology? And uh, one, Thing I have is like um, by providing that API access, you don't need to set up your own compute. You don't need to basically kind of know kind of how to fine tune those kind of stuff. And in a way, it is kind of through API access or even through this kind of ChatGPT, way more kind of people were able to experience this technology rather than say you kind of open source like a whole weight from like GitHub. You had to kind of set up your own kind of compute to deploy your own kind of serve. So. Um, I think one thing that's kind of particularly helpful for this application kind of layer is to have uh, this kind of discussion about open source versus kind of API, what are pros and cons, what are safety things, all those together, and then what's truly gonna be the enabling thing for all the people, not just the, not just the IT company that can hire like 100 engineers, but anyone, like high schoolers, or like a mom who wants a second career, who, people who don't know anything about programming, how they can use this kind of technology to build application, build business. This is the true democratization, and we should do this in a safe way. So I think that's kind of one point. Um, yeah, and then in terms of the kind of all the types of applications that you can kind of build on top of it, um, what I kind of want is as many people as kind of possible, with different perspectives to kind of try on it. And then uh, one thing I kind of been mentioning is like things uh, until last year. The thing that kind of surprised me, so for example, like until 14, I was surprised by this kind of pioneer, people kind of writing the CUDA, doing deep learning exploration. Um, 14 to 18 was like algorithmic researchers and deep learning. 18 to 22 is like a scaling researchers. But you know, and, and we kind of discussed, you know, it's kind of a matter of time. We have headway, but people are gonna catch up. People can at least kind of build this level of, you know, kind of few years. But what surprised me from last year was what kind of application people were gonna build on top of this. So I think from last year, the, the true surprise for us is really the UI, UX, business layers, and all those different sectors, education, laws, everything, and creative space. I'm a huge fan of that kind of creative spaces, uh, and kind of love to, and in, because in a way, like anything that's economically valuable, a certain kind of, like, oh, I don't know, like <laughs> some kind of like a task completion. So if you kind of create a tool that gets your task completed, you kind of don't need to kind of go beyond it. But with creativity, with art, it's endless. It's, it's all about uh, like humor, those kind of stuff. So uh, I also kind of feel this creative spaces where as a gentle AI can really enable a lot of productive work that we kind of do right now, but we can still find endless empowerment, endless satisfaction, endless exploration in. Do you have comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You seem to have so a comment. So I okay. totally agree with you. And, uh, yeah, so, so because in this m room, so there's many founders of startups, so I commented so about this, how to the, the, the make the, the competition, the competitive landscape, but uh, the actuality, so what's happening now is so, so anyone can create a new application, not only the startup founders or engineers. This is what's happening. And this is what's maybe originally Alan Kay, so <laughs> dreamed, and then, so, if the 100% of people can make the application, the, the purpose will be changed. And then, so I think most of the engineers, the professional engineers work on the enterprise or startups to deliver the application to more than 10,000 people, 
one million people to make it business. But so the making application itself is not for business. The first is the, the dream of the Alan K. And then if so 100 people, 100 percent of people can create the application, it's a kind of the letter to someone, to one person. And so I will build a one application to someone. And then this, this is what's happening now. And this is an amazing opportunity for everyone uh, in this world. Do you have any comments? Well, I'm just going to add, sure. like, it's a time of ferment, and it's exciting. And the underlying technology isn't actually ready, <laughs> right? I mean, I think there's no one even in the space who says, like, this is actually really ready for prime time, and we're able to rely on it for, um, we'll say, life important decisions. Mm -hmm creativity. And so like it is an odd moment, the best of times and the worst of times. Yeah. Right? Is it one percent error message, one percent hallucination, ten like, you know, it'll get better over time, but but uh, you would tell me differently, but as far as I know, there's no one out there who's saying it's really ready for that kind of turn it loose on a billion people on stuff, you know, like where the decision actually it, it has to be right. Yeah, for for life altering decisions, now ready. Or mortgages, or you know, like things that affect life-altering for sure. But there's a lot yeah. in that in that pyramid for something that really matters in how you treat people. It's not ready yet. So, um, like, yeah, it's kind of all in beta, but we're the subjects. Yeah, that that's why pretty much kind of OPA is doing this like uh, incremental deployment of feature by feature to kind of see the reaction and also kind of always kind of put this kind of research mode thing and. Uh, yeah, and also spending a lot of resources on the safety. Yeah. So after GBD4 finished training, basically six months was dedicated for the just uh, safety fine tuning, and we're doing more and more of it. Mm -hmm. So, so as the AI is being democratized and a lot of application being developed, while at the same time the foundation model or the, this AI technology itself is still uh, under development, uh, the, the big question is, you know, how to ensure the uh, you know AI safety without uh, regulating it too much. Um, Kitano-san, do you have any uh, view on the AI regulation and making sure that it's, uh, you know, the use of it will be uh, safe? Well, I, I think like uh, you know, all, all kind of discussion going on on the uh, AI safety and also like a responsible AI from the uh, uh, you know uh, as soon as like uh, uh, you know uh, we see the uh, significant capability of the deep learning as now I come to the like, all the generative AI. Uh, next week, I'll fly into the uh, San Francisco. The World Economic Forum is uh, hosting the uh, uh, major event on the uh, focusing uh, specifically on the generative AI. And that was originally focusing more on the uh, responsible AI in general, but now focusing on the uh, particular in the generative AI, uh, particularly in uh, responsible uh, AI aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll be on the, uh, I think I'll be on the final panel with the uh, uh, Eric Horvitz and Yan Lukan mm -hmm. uh, on the final day. Uh, so, uh, Looking forward to uh, flying over there, uh, but I think uh, you know that will be a lot of discussions. Uh, on that. At the same time, like uh, you know, uh, probably the literacy on the uh, user side. You know, I think like a lot of application gonna be built. You know, right now people directly access to the uh, GPT four, you know, OpenAI, Chat GPT. But at the same time, like uh, there'll be, you know, I, I think we're gonna see like a tons of startup actually, uh, you know, but built on top of the. Uh, uh, you know, GPT-4 or uh, other platforms, you know, I think we're going to see the Cambrian explosion. So, uh, you know, I think like very quickly we'll understand, uh, you know, what the best use case, like, uh, you know, I, I think there are many of them. And for example, like, uh, you know, using this uh, capability for the uh, uh, programming, coding, actually, you dramatically improve the productivity, uh, you know, in the magnitude more efficient uh, in a way. But at the same time, you know, sometimes it generates like, uh, uh, totally unexecutable code as well. So it's not perfect, but uh, people will very quickly learn and develop very quickly and ensure that as well. But, uh, but the, another layer is like uh, education part, how people are gonna use it. So some university actually banned the use of uh, chat GBT or uh, like a bad or whatever, like a generative AI for the uh, uh, essays or assignment. Well, I actually teach at the, uh, uh, right now that this semester, I teach a course on sustainability, at the ICU, and then uh, this is jointly with the uh, SFC, KOSFC, with the Ataka-san. And in our course, we decided that we're going to, for uh, 
uh, weapons free. Uh, so like uh, you know, students can freely use the chat GPT, whatever they are, you know, they're not able capability for assignment. Uh, so I think like we're going to do the uh, three assignment at the end, which one, one is like, a, we'll get some of the uh, task actually ask a question to the uh, chat GPT and then uh, ask a student to verify that. You know, that would be interesting. And then the second one is we try to prove into the uh, task like uh, which uh, hit the weakness of the current generative AI model. So uh, ask a student to uh, you know, answer the question, whatever, whatever you, uh, you know, we come up with the, uh, we use such a GPT or a bug may potentially have a, a problem, which is as simple using it, they have to keep verifying that. So that would be extremely good the opportunity for students to learn, uh, you know, benefit and limitations. Also, like uh, through the uh, uh, verification process, students must have like in-depth knowledge of the subject as well. The third one would be interesting, um, but I, I'm planning to actually have the uh, uh, task which can only be achievable if you have the full use of generative AI. And with that generative AI, you cannot achieve the task. That is the kind of assignment. You know, this is very interesting because uh, this actually demonstrates how our capability can be augmented by the proper use of generative AI. And I have to, uh, probably I have to work with, uh, you know, Shane or other people, what, what the best use case of this. But like, I have a few ideas, but I think like, uh, uh, that would be extremely interesting and lighting for the student, you know, you know, opportunity and limitation of the new kind of technology. And I think a student could be excited about this because they are part of the uh, frontier of the technological revolution. They are part of that. And I think we need to have like a kind of like a uh, more AI native student who actually really understand, uh, you know, uh, you know, strengths and limitations. Every technology has strengths and limitations. You know, generative AI is no exception. But like a point is like, you know, things have changed. You know, we're not going back to the past. So like a student need to learn how to properly handle that, how to use those technology argument their intellectual capability and the problem solving skills. And I think that is probably the most important thing. You know, I think that that's really the uh, uh, key aspect of the, uh, uh, how to uh, move things forward. We, you know, we have to really understand what have changed. So um, it's a little bit early, but I want to open up uh, the floor for questions. I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Uh, and so please uh, address your question um, in, in less than uh, 30 seconds. And also if you could start by Addressing whom you want the question to answer, uh, who, who do you want the question uh, to be responded to? Okay, so uh, just want to have a question about the limitation of the generative AI. So one thing I'm concerned about these days is like non-technical executives are being approached by a lot of software companies saying, oh, you know, this generative AI technology will solve all the problems and that you can replace all the call center, you know, agent, all those things, right? Where does the data coming from for to feed into the model? The, the technical people, don't technical people don't understand. So any advice on you know limitation of the generative AI, common misunderstandings and okay. those kind of stuff. We'll probably take a few questions at the same time. So limitation of AI. And do you have someone? Do you want the question to direct? Are you directing question to someone in particular? Not really. Not, not, not really. Generally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for the interesting discussion. I have a question that any any one of you can answer. Uh, recently, Elon Musk um, and a thousand other tech leaders requested that there be a moratorium on developing AI systems further um, in order to avoid some potentially catastrophic effects on society. Do you agree with that? Or do you support that? Why or why not? And then my, my second question is for Kitano-san or Shane-san. I come from the music industry, and so the development of AI-created music raises all sorts of copyright questions, and I would like to know what you think about that with companies like Universal Music asking companies like Spotify, Apple Music to pull down AI-generated songs recently. Thank you. Okay, maybe so, one more. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, my, actually, the follow-on to that. Um, so there are critics on that 1,000-person <coughs> list who say that this is going to destroy the world. So we're moving from move fast, break things, to act hastily, hastily destroy everyone. How do we protect ourselves? Question for all of you. Can I? Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I have a question. Uh, do we, 
uh, still keep using smartphone and uh, uh, laptop for using uh, chat GPT. And uh, Kitano-san, uh, you're known as a robotics professional. Uh, is there some kind of change will happen in robotics field? You know, we have such a winter time for long, t for long in robotics, and maybe robo dumb robot can be smarter with that. And uh, I, I want to know your idea. OK, thank you. That's a lot of questions. Um, so limitation on, on J, uh, generative AI, uh, Shane? OK, and then. Uh, moratorium on AI development, I'll ask Michel. Or Ken san Ken san <laughs> Okay. Uh, Kitano san, uh, AI, you know, copyright issues, uh, uh, and also uh, change on hardware, the last question. And I think, how do we protect ourselves? Then, Michel. Okay. So let's start with Shane. Sure. So there are a lot of limitations, uh, obviously. And then, so in terms of like ho this kind of hallucination and accuracy, there's still like a lot of issues. So basically like, I, I think kind of one easy to understand example is that if you ask for somebody's bio to large language model, it's always gonna get the birth date wrong. <laughs> and one kind of intuitive kind of understanding that I, I kind of propose is like, if you get the date wrong, that doesn't really affect the generation of the previous text or text after. So large language model in the end is basically a prediction machine. So it's basically like the, the, how much this kind of correlation there is. So this kind of factuality, a lot of kind of facts that people kind of tend to memorize, generally if you kind of request a language model to do, it's pretty bad at. There are many ways to get around it. So there's a plugin release, and then within that is a retrieval kind of module. And with, so that's used as kind of embedding. So with this, you can do much better, but still there's like um, certain issues. So my best, and, and then there are many kind of aspects that many other kind of limitations. Uh, my kind of recommendation, at least for the time being, is especially for this sort of um, decision making or something that's kind of matters, always kind of ha have a human in the loop. So when you kind of say everything's gonna be automated on that, um, always kind of keep kind of people in the loop and try to kind of really log where it kind of fails. And then if you have people watching it, if you understand where it fails, you kind of begin to gradually understand the kind of mind of the large language model and their patterns, their patterns of limitations. I don't say I can talk about all the limitations given a limited time, but that's what I recommend. Have human in the loop and collect all those things and analyze those. Use human intelligence to understand those and treat a large language model because it's, it's completely, it's trained without the embodiment, it's trained without the, it's trained on this internet data which is different, <laughs> kind of like a daily kind of interaction kind of data. Uh, and it's not, went through this kind of evolution or different kind of embodiment and grounding and multi-agent interaction, those kind of stuff. So treat as a different intelligence that's very ca capable but don't be, don't overestimate it or underestimate it. So human the loop, understand and yeah. And uh, more uh, question about the moratorium on the AI development. Yeah, actually, six months is not enough to <laughs> solve this problem. And uh, in that sense, okay, if if it's three years, it's impossible. And uh, so I think in that sense, uh, the point is so how to uh, to find the solution instead of stop the innovation. And then so one idea is so for example, and uh, for the hallucination problem. One is the watermark, and uh, I think maybe you're already so involved. Yeah, yeah please, if you know. Oh, oh, yeah, like another thing is that, so I, I think there's like a lot of capitalistic sort of motivations around that proposal as well. Mm -hmm. Where people basically want to see the yeah. best player just kind of stop, and you can kind of clearly see for many independents. But the other thing is that there are many ways that we can work together to have a discussion. Uh, I don't think stopping is the right solution based on what I talk to many people. Uh, but for example, this like a watermarking, kind of how can you make sure technology can detect, which is not perfect, but we can advance research on that. Another thing is that when the OpenAI announced the GPT-4, we also open sourced OpenAI eBoss. I was also part of that as well. And then it's basically the um, suite of code that uh, OpenAI uses to benchmark the capabilities of large language models. And within there, if we can kind of work together, for example, to build the open source safety 
metric or protocols, then we can even use that to regulate um, not just the open AI kind of large language model, but like other big companies' language model, which have huge capitalistic incentive to push harder without the safety checks, and also the open source community, which also have a huge sort of a fame kind of a incentive to push uh, hard without the safety kind of concerns. So in, f in fact, in terms of the, that, rather than the six month moratorium, what I kind of propose is to kind of work together, discuss together what should be the safety, and then kind of build this kind of uh, shared kind of safety benchmark as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, that's like one example. Okay, thanks. And, and Kitano-san, uh, the question on copyright as well as the change in the hardware, robotics? Yeah. Uh, in a copyright issue, I think like uh, you know, uh, I, I know there's uh, uh, many concerns. All the some of the uh, aspect uh, legal actions has been taken for some uh, uh, big foundation on the provider today. But at the same time, uh, I, I think like uh, you know, I hope like uh, this thing is to be uh, solved uh, by appreciating the uh, right holders. And uh, in terms of the music industry, I know about the position of the Universal's uh, Sony's position. I think would be. Uh, I'll, I have like a robot stringer head of the Sony Music Entertainment to uh, answer the uh, position, but he's not here, so, <laughs> you know. So uh, from the, uh, our perspective or the uh, technology perspective, we do have a, a series of uh, AI for music project, and we actually released some of them already, and some of them actually part of the uh, uh, DAO, uh, which is a digital audio workstation, uh, like a Steinberg and others. And uh, so what we actually do is like create like a uh, kind of generative AI uh, models or the various aspects. And then uh, we use that uh, using uh, like a musician's own piece or like uh, we uh, create like a, a quite, uh, quite large scale size of like a, uh, you know, uh, seed uh, data by ourselves uh, rather than uh, using the uh, uh, you know, general musicians, uh, you know, sound source. And then that brought the musician to use it. And then actually a few musicians, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, Sony Music in the France, uh, released album uh, using uh, AI tools. Or like uh, some musician even uh, actually generated the uh, uh, data uh, for the others to be used, you know. So musician, musician they, they just wants to actually have like uh, their own style of music generated, uh, you know, created using the, by assisted by the, the AI technology, so that that one thing, okay. And then uh, you know, I know uh, a few uh, you know, company provide a fully automated uh, music. I think that's kind of interesting frontiers, and then uh, I'll see how that pan out. I mean, uh, so that would be uh, interesting. But at the same time, usually people wants to actually have a drama. He he people wants to see like a human drama behind this, like a. You know, so for example, like, uh, you know, who's composing this music? What is the personal story of, like, an artist? You know, so, like, uh, you know, you know, mu mu nice music generated fully by the AI is, is interesting. I think, as I say, in a way, that's that kind of, uh, uh, well, kind of curious to see that how that actually evolved. At the same time, like, uh, people not listen to music, not just because of the music, but also by the, uh, uh, you know, story behind the uh, music, like, uh, you know, artist. And the people like artists, and that's why uh, they're curious what next thing that artists came up about. So I think that is actually the uh, how the market play out, and I think it's a really interesting to see how those technology and then uh, you know creators inject because like, that has been a history from the beginning. It's like all the art piece, like uh, uh, for example, like uh, uh, impressionist, and then uh, you know that's affected by the uh, all the uh, uh, chemical revolution and the photography as well. So like always, uh, uh, creators has been uh, in inspired by technology, and the technology uh, impact the uh, creators, creators impact the next generation technology. And I think that we are just moving into yet another stage. Uh, you know, uh, I'm kind of very curious to see uh, how this is gonna uh, evolve. Okay. Uh, on the robotics side, I think like, uh, you know, this is like a, a new, uh, new, renewed capability of the AI, by generative AI will impact the robotics uh, as well. And then uh, not just like a capability to have a dialogue with the, uh, uh, you know, or some uh, uh, users, uh, but as well as like, a, we can actually have like a robotics motion to be fully generated by the, uh, uh, you know, generative AI capability and in, uh, in many uh, many ways. So I think like a motion control the robotics and in the perception around it, uh, uh, you know, you can actually perceive uh, things to be uh, uh, controlled by the new uh, kind of AI. At the same time, like a robotics, the physical thing, 
So like if they screw up, that will actually destroy something or like hurt people. So like we need a high precision and much more safety because uh, you know unlike like uh, you know interactive uh, chatbot or query uh, queue, this one has a physical effect. You know you know if you screw up, uh, you can actually destroy things. You can actually hurt people. So we need to have like a much higher level of safety on what has been generated, uh, you know, uh, if we use like uh, uh, some of the generative AI capability into the body. But at the same time, like uh, you can have like a high level command and you can have like a more uh, strict like a control theory, control theory uh, to actually control the robot with a specific like a uh, uh, envelope of motion so that can actually safeguard uh, like, uh, you know, dangerous uh, motions or like, uh, you know, uh, restrict the space of operation. You know, so like I, I don't think people are too naive to be able to actually, uh, you know, use the technology without any safeguard. Uh, as far as you, have, you know, when you apply to the robotics, so all the robotics researchers are very aware. Uh, as, as far as they are in in the field, you know, if someone come into robotics without knowing those, uh, you know, uh, fundamental things, we don't know. But uh, uh, you know, those who are in the field for a long period of time, uh, you know, legacy period of time, uh, where experienced as engineers will know. Uh, what they can do, you know, what where the danger is. So uh, I'm pretty optimistic that this will actually have like uh, quite advancement in the robotics as well. But at the same time, like a problem robotics, not just technology, what the use case and the cost. Usually, the uh, what the biggest uh, 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 factors actually prevent robotics into the real field is that human labor is way cheaper than the introduction of robotics, and that that, that is the cost issue uh, is actually the. Uh, uh, problem rather than the technology. Uh, that, that's a reality we are okay. facing right now. Thanks, thanks, Kenosa. And, and lastly, the, I think the big question was the, the how do we protect ourselves? Does anyone want to take it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll say a few things. Partial answer. Um, but, well, I'll start at the other end then. I'll say, okay, so how, how do uh, societies and people protect themselves? So there's some answers here from the participants um, that we heard, um, some about the joint working together piece. The cynical part of me wonders if the moratorium would make that go faster or slower. So, um, but, but part one to how we protect ourselves is the environment in which the uh, you know, entrepreneurs or creators are working. So you've heard some possibilities there. Um, the other way is typically uh, you would take the incentive out of the race to be first, uh, which is partly excitement and partly financial, you, you can see now. Um, how do societies do that? They regulate. Um, or you assign liability in, in, in countries with rule of law. Uh, and so from you know, what I hear in the environment, you know, I think both of those things are, are under consideration. Like I'm not, I'm not I'm not a legislator or you know a, a justice, so it's not me. But but I would say, like the the chance of regulation in Europe seems really high to me. That's not to say it will be good regulation, right? Because who knows how? You know, uh, even if it's possible, um, I think there's a real movement towards some big framework which takes forever. And then I think a smaller and and more recent movement about how do we use existing laws. Like how, you know, the kind of discussion of, well, there is copyright law. <laughs> what does that mean for the material? Certainly for artists and known figures, um, there's data privacy. So I, I think we're going to see a mix of all of that. But um, really, I think the technology is happening. So I think there's some answer, which is it's hard to stop a new technology. Uh, and so while, you know, especially around me, you know, like, you know, Mozilla hears a lot about regulate, regulate, regulate. I do think that, like, the, the technological aspects of it are going to be really key. Uh, we're talking about a danger, but we have to actually uh, have to recognize without, like, a, you know, new capability of AI to move things forward, develop new technology. And then also, like, the next big thing on the uh, AI or next generation would be a scientific discovery. And without that, we might at least go to climate change and all things. And I agree with like uh, uh, Demis Hazabis when he said like, uh, uh, you know, if we need AI to survive. You know, we have to recognize that we are in a danger. Uh, you know, I think we have to use AI technologies and all other technology to be able to solve uh, big climate issues and all the planetary agenda. And we, ha we have to we have to be very careful, uh, just focusing on danger of AI. There are other things uh, which endanger us. 
Okay, um, so that's a big topic. I'm sure there are a lot of more questions. We can carry those to probably cocktail hours. Uh, but uh, let's thank all the panelists uh, for their insightful comments. Thank you very much. <laughs>